Before I begin, I'd like to invite Dr. Chandrima Chakraborty uh, to speak briefly uh, about a territorial acknowledgement. Hi, everyone. It's a, a great, great pleasure to join you for the annual South Asia lecture series. Uh, I am Chandrima Chakravarti. I'm a professor in the Department of English and Cultural Studies, and I teach uh, both undergraduate and graduate courses on South Asian literatures and cu cultures. Uh, I'm therefore very grateful for this opportunity every year uh, to invite to campus a scholar um, or an artist working in the area of South Asian studies. Uh, the annual South Asia lecture series is a free annual classroom and community lecture series on South Asia. The lecture series is made possible by the generous support of Kalpana Raina, who is a graduate of our program, and we are deeply thankful for her uh, generosity in supporting and uh, stimulating conversations uh, in the field of South Asian studies. Uh, this lecture at McMaster University is being held virtually, but McMaster University is located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and the Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Uh, the Dish uh, with One Spoon uh, reminds us that we shared this territory with one spoon and therefore it is our responsibility to ensure that the Dish is never empty. Um, that is this land with its peoples and its flora, fauna are to be shared, protected and cherished. Okay. This uh, reminder of how uh, indigenous peoples in this land welcomed and shared their land with settlers and immigrants seems to resonate well with our lecture today, as we have Ashwin Singh joining us from Durban, South Africa, a city that similar to Hamilton has also experienced the multiple flows of people from South Asia, Africa and Europe. And we are delighted to have Ashwin Singh with us today, who will be sharing his unique experience as an Afri-Indian artist. Uh, welcome Ashwin, and thank you Dr. Rose for introducing Ashwin to us. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you Ch Dr. Chakraborty. So it is my pleasure to introduce South African playwright, lecturer and lawyer, Ashwin Singh. Singh is joining us from Durban, a city located on the east coast of South Africa. It is the third largest in the country behind Johannesburg and Cape Town. Durban's east-facing port on the Indian Ocean situates it as a central node in the transnational flow of people and goods between South Asia, Africa, and Europe. These movements shape the distinct culture and energy of the city. Singh, a resident of Durban, is attuned to the multiple flows, forms of exchange that occur in this unique space, ranging from container ships navigating the southern coast of Africa, to the influx of food and spices from the South Asian diaspora, to the large Zulu population for which the province that Durban occupies, KwaZulu-Natal, is partly named. In his plays, Singh frequently draws attention to this complex history of exchange and movement along Durban's coastline. In works such as Rioka Light and Spice and Stuff, Singh explores the links between space, time, and identity for the South Asian diaspora in South Africa. Rioka Light explores the violence of Indian indentureship under British colonial rule, the abhorrent conditions that laborers endured while working on sugarcane plantations in the 1870s, and how these crises were later compounded by apartheid laws which spurred additional displacements for people of Indian origin within South Africa. In Spice and Stuff, Singh focuses on the historic Gray Street Trading District. This area served as a major economic and social hub for people, uh, sorry, for people of Indian origin within South Africa. In Spice and Stuff, Singh focuses, or sorry, this area served as a major economic and social hub for people of Indian origin and was subsequently targeted by authorities enforcing apartheid laws between 1948 and 1990. The scope of Singh's work expands beyond colonial era and apartheid crises. These plays uh, like Two House and Duped, or sorry, in plays like Two House and Duped, he foregrounds the challenges surrounding post-apartheid nation building as formerly segregated spaces are opened up to all South Africans. Duped and Two House emphasize how political shifts in the state, including the dissolution of racist apartheid laws and post-independence efforts at economic redistribution, have led to additional tensions between various groups in Durban. In Two House, this causes conflict between members of a gated community 
because limited resources place neighbors in direct conflict over control of a community council. In Duped, perhaps one of Singh's most experimental plays, science fiction icons such as spaceships and robots help his work to explore people's ongoing concerns around surveillance and racial integration in the new rainbow nation. Singh's works comment on contemporary relationships between Zulu, Afrikaner, and Anglo-South Africans, but also identify how members of the South Asian diaspora, Afro-Indians to use the term that Singh employs in the title of this talk, negotiate ongoing racial divisions that were entrenched throughout apartheid. Singh is a highly celebrated playwright in Durban's artistic scene. Anthologies of his early works, such as Durban Dialogue's Indian Voice, have led to a recent Florian scholarship devoted to his work. Singh's extensive list of achievements, including three national awards at the Performing Arts Network of South Africa's Play Reading Festival for Two House, Duped, and Rioka Light, show he has had a considerable impact on the genre of contemporary South African drama. He has also published multiple anthologies, anthologies of his plays, uh, namely Durban Dialogues, uh, Indian Voice in 2013, and a more recent publication titled Durban Dialogues Then and Now in 2017. Most recently, he has shifted into film with a documentary titled Cane Cutter's Transcendence, which has been selected to run at film festivals in India, New Zealand, Kenya, and the UK. Please join me in warmly welcoming Ashwin Singh to present this year's annual South Asia lecture in the Department of English and Cultural Studies at McMaster University. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rose, um, and Prof. Chagravati for that wonderful introduction and for this magnificent opportunity to engage with your community. Uh, I'm delighted and honored to be here and to be part of the McMaster series of lectures. Um, I'm going to divide my talk into two sections. The first half of the talk will focus on identity of the South Asian community in contemporary South Africa, and then move on to a brief history of um, theater from the South Asian community in South Africa. Uh, and then the second half will focus on my journey and the journey of my theater company, the Singh Siblings PTY Limited, um, culminating in a little examination at the end on the impact of COVID-19 on the theater scene in South Africa. Um, I want to start off with my title. I've called it an Afro-Indian Odyssey in Post-Apartheid South Africa. Um, the first thing I should say is that um, the, the term South Asian and Indian is used almost interchangeably in South Africa, but not in the wider world where the South Asian uh, diaspora has a significant um, 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 impact. Um, in the UK, for example, I don't hear the term Indian used very much. It's South Asian. But in South Africa, we tended to use the term Indian a lot more than South Asian, although perhaps South Asian would be more accurate, being a more encompassing term. Um, through apartheid legislation, we came to be categorized as being Indian, and that um, a term stuck. Um, but it is disputed now, not only in terms of South Asian, but also in terms of the broader context of us being South African. Um, but I'll expand on that as we go on. I just wanted to make a note initially about South Asian versus Indian. If I get caught in this um, uh, in these semantics and use the term Indian, I'm certainly referring to South Asian as well. Um, the Odyssey term um, that I use, I think is significant because this community which came from India as indentured laborers and which some of us in South Africa refer to as slavery, others dispute this suggesting that there was a way out of indenture because there was a contract for a specific period and then one could leave and go back to India, ignore certain socio-political realities and the economic conditions in which these people found themselves. It certainly to me was slavery. So it, we moved from slavery to becoming significantly involved in the socio-economic fabric of South African society, and then into the full participation in a constitutional democracy. And through that process, we've played a very significant role as a community, both in the struggle against apartheid and in um, defining our new uh, political and social landscape in post-apartheid South Africa. Um, and that odyssey, I think, is in some way mirrored by the Singh siblings' journey. And I, I don't mean to be presumptuous in suggesting that my personal journey could in any way resemble the journey from slavery to participation in a democracy. 
but it has been an eventful and long journey, which is of course what Odyssey means. And so I think that the process of my initially coming from um, um, the legal sphere and academia and then moving into the arts and not being particularly welcome initially by um, the art sector because I'm always from the outside. And then also being involved in a number of uh, disputes regarding racial discrimination, as well as um, ethnic chauvinism. And then the journey towards wider acceptance in South Africa, and then finally international impact is quite an odyssey. And hence I, I use the term. So this is what I have in mind in respect of the title. I then say Afri Indian, which is a term that I believe um, Prof. Pallavi Rastogi from Louisiana State University first used in her book, Afri-Indian Fiction in 2008. Um, it may have been used prior to that, but she certainly used it in formal literature. And uh, it's a term I've coined as well, because it, it, in short, it means African Indian. And I think that is exactly the identity of South Asian people in contemporary South Africa. We see ourselves by and large is both African and Indian or South Asian uh, because of our close connection to the Indian subcontinent, but also us having been here now, I'm a fifth generation um, South African. And so we are tied to this continent and very much have great passion for the continent of Africa. Are we fully accepted? That's partly what I'm going to explore in my talk. And so I'll come to that shortly, but that's the idea of Afri-Indian. Now, what does that mean, though, um, um, to contemporary um, uh, South Asian South Africans? Do they, can they describe themselves accurately in this way? Well, my film that um, um, Copeland has mentioned, The Cane Cutter's Transcendence, examined uh, identity of South Asians and their place in contemporary South Africa. And I asked a number of people the question of, of identity. Who are you? What do you represent in South Africa? Where do you stand in South Africa? And there were a variety of answers, but most people, um, and I, 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 I spoke to people who are cultural officers, professionals, entrepreneurs, academics. Um, they identified themselves first and foremost as South Africans or Africans, and then of Indian origin. Someone like Raymond Perrier, from the, um, uh, the director of the uh, multi-fate organization, the, De uh, the Dennis Hurley Center in Durban, um, suggested that we don't have a South Asian community, but many South Asian communities, because the older South Asians differ quite significantly in terms of their perspectives to the younger Indian South Asians. And then we also have um, a, a different religions, uh, which in South Africa um, um, uh, coexist very peacefully, but they are different religions. And sometimes the same families have people from different religions in the family. Um, and then we also have a flourishing gay community. Um, there's also gender identity to examine. So he didn't feel that we could be described as one South Asian community. I think that's a very accurate depiction. Um, I would describe myself as black, a South African of Indian or South Asian origin, a child of the universe, a lawyer, academic, playwright, actor and filmmaker, and a humble servant of God. And for me, that suggests, again, a, a multiple layered identity. Um, and I'm comfortable with that. I don't want to be labeled. But labeling is still a very significant thing in South Africa. And there certainly is still very much a dominant feature in South Africa of the South Asian or Indian stereotype um, within the community and certainly outside of it as well, in other race groups. Let me say that I don't believe in the existence of race, but we have come to accept it in South Africa, um, as we do in the wider world because of its social construct. Um, but I had signed up in the contemporary South Africa and post apartheid South Africa for a non-racial project, and that hasn't been forthcoming. We are still very much a racially divided society, and so the issue of identity has to be examined within this context. Um, at various times during my talk, I'll be doing some short readings from my plays that I think are quite illustrative and um, would add to the creativity of the presentation. So I want to read a little excerpt now from um, Into the Grey, uh, which is uh, one of my recent plays from my second anthology. And it's about identity. The character Logan, who's of South Asian descent, speaks to the character Sandile, who is of um, Zulu descent, and says the following. I'm not an Indian, not as you define it. 
I eat bunny chows, but I don't like brandy and coke. I drink castle lager. I don't support the Indian cricket team. I don't support the South African cricket team. Not until there's real transformation. I live with my parents. I'll take care of them when they grow old. But I don't have a cousin who fixed me a holiday job in his department store. I take the taxi to campus. My father's old Fiat doesn't have mag wheels and a sound system that's more expensive than the car. Yes, like many Indians, I'm studying medicine, but I'm not going to emigrate to London when I qualify. I want to serve my African brothers and sisters. Tell that to your comrades next time they mock me again, calling me a lamington because I speak eloquently and asking me to sponsor them a briyani. I think in many ways that is illustrative of the conflict that many people of South Asian descent find themselves when they are categorized and put into this box. Um, academic and performing artist Darusha Mudli in my film, The King Cut Transcendence, uh, indicated this conflict that young South Asians feel. She said um, they're in a position where they can't claim to be South African because they're not actually Black African. And then they can't claim to be Indian because they're not actually from India. So they're somewhere caught in between. You would think after 160 years that we certainly would have uh, a place that is more accepted by the wider community in South Africa. There is no doubt that the contributions of this community are certainly valued. There is no doubt that there are great friendships between individuals within the different communities, South Asian, Zulu, Kosa, multiple heritage, um, 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 Afrikaans, white South African, English, white South African. Certainly, I have many friends across the cultural spectrum as well. But generally speaking, the community feels a fair amount of alienation now, particularly after the last 10 years, which has been described in South Africa as the years of state capture, uh, where a particular group of people have been pushing um, for their plan to secure long-term prosperity at the expense of the Black African majority, even though they pretend that it is the exact opposite that they want. And in the process, the, the, the South Asian and the mixed race or multiple heritage communities have been sidelined in a number of ways, politically and economically. Um, of course, some of this as well is just political posturing um, by narrow-minded politicians who are seeking election and uh, representative power by um, exploiting these situations. But some of it is real. And there is certainly a deterioration in race relations, I believe, in the last decade, after some tremendous gains in the initial part of the new South Africa. Um, so I, I feel that um, in the examining identity, um, one has to um, uh, contextualize it as the current situation that we find ourselves in South Africa. Um, and at the moment, um, there are a fair number of people um, from the South Asian community who are making more and more statements publicly that they, are, they feel they're being alienated and also who are drawing more inward. So we have a lot of insularity happening right now, which is sad because we should be opening up, of course, in this new South Africa to the kind of rainbow nation that uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela spoke about uh, years ago. Um, one other piece I'd like to read to you before I move to the um, uh, history section. And that's another one about identity. And this is about my gambling granny, who's become one of my famous characters uh, from the play Beyond the Big Banks. Um, uh, she's been interviewed by an obnoxious young woman who comes to casinos to understand why old people gamble. And this is how this passage goes. It makes me so sad that you just killing your Saturday here at the casino. I mean, you're an Indian granny. Oh, I was pissed off by this question by Miss Maraj. Is that what I am? An Indian granny. And what is an Indian granny? Someone who waltzes around all day, happily doing the household chores, and who waits on her loving grandchildren, who don't insult her and swear her and pinch her and punch her and who always wears a sari and goes to temple and all family weddings, whether she likes it or not. And on Saturday, she quietly watches a nice Bollywood DVD. Well, let me tell you, Miss Marat, two weeks ago, I didn't come to the casino on Saturday. I stayed at home that afternoon because relatives from Peter Maritzburg were coming to visit us and we had to put on a show of solidarity. Monday to Friday, we get on with our separate lives. I help my son and daughter-in-law to clean, 
to take care of the kids. They go to their jobs. I work in the garden. Then they come home and eat in the dining room. I eat in my bedroom. Then I watch a show on my portable TV and go to bed. We hardly speak. But on Saturday, we had to all hug and kiss our relatives and act like a happy family. The next morning, my son gave me 200 rand and said, uh, thank you, Ma, here's some money. You can go blow it at the casino. What a farce. Well, I won't play that game anymore. I'll wear a sari when I want to. And sometimes I'll wear a skirt. I'll go to the temple when I feel the call to go. And I won't go to every family wedding. I will no longer slave for my children. And I'll come to the casino whenever I want to come. I'm not your Indian grand. So I think that's quite illustrative of the stereotype of uh, people of um, South Asian origin, even by people within the community. I'm going to expand a bit on that a little bit later when I talk about um, the current situation regarding artistic works in South Africa from the South Asian community. But I want to move on then to a brief history of uh, the contributors from the South Asian communities to South African theatre. Um, there's been significant research conducted in this regard by Prof Pranab Joshipura from Mahila College in Gujarat. Uh, he's one of the leading scholars on my work as well. Uh, also by a South African scholar, a retired academic now, Dr. Betty Govindin, who's one of our leading literary critics, and also by Dr. Sarasivan Anamalai, who did his PhD on um, the history of South Asian theater in South Africa uh, from indenture to 1998. So that's a little bit out of date, but it has done quite a comprehensive job until 1998. And I've examined their work and also done some of my own research. So uh, presenting an overview of this then, um, initially the, the community that came from the South of India to South Africa uh, brought with them their epic tales and they were from a storytelling tradition and so there were a lot of rituals and religious um, uh, um, functions of theatre at that time it was utterly informal mainly through a storytelling uh, tradition that was passed down through those generations and of course I think it's very well described by um, Dr. Joshipora in his book, South African Indian Drama, as well as in the book of articles on my plays, Durban Dialogue Dissected. And he gives a very poignant description of what it might, must have been like at that time in those horrible conditions when the elders told tales to their children. And I'll just read that to you. He says, um, Every night, an ideal India, an imaginary homeland, must have been recreated in this tiny little space, providing much needed courage to survive amidst the harsh conditions of indenture. The oral storytelling tradition led to temple festivals whose dance dramas known as Katakali or Terakutu were performed. These temple festivals were cultural and social gatherings, which also marked community building processes. People must have gathered there to find their India, which they had left behind, their home, which had become a forbidden place for them because of Kalapani, a point of no return, the India which second generation Indian South Africans had never seen. I'm trying to imagine those moments, and it must have been um, in the horrible conditions they found themselves, quite courageous for these people to keep these traditions alive. Um, according to Pranav and Betty Govindan as well, the performances that happened in these informal uh, situations were um, uh, multifaceted. They involved drama, poetry, music, and dance, uh, and largely were ritualist. Um, in time, it became quite obvious to the elders in the indentured community that they had to focus on education to empower their children. And therefore, they began to uh, build schools to emphasize education as a way out of slavery. And initially, these were done in the vernacular. And Tamil would have been the most uh, spoken language at the time. But in due course, they realized that uh, because of colonial situation they were in, they had to learn to speak English. And they began education and instruction of the English language. This led then to theater being performed in English. Again, it was largely ritualistic, largely around religion. But in time, um, there were a few experimental plays held. Not much is known about that. But the next significant step is that in 1967, 
a theater director from India, Krishna Shah, came to South Africa um, to do a workshop. And that was the first formal theater presentations that happened from the South Asian community, according to Pranav, to Betty, to, to Sarasivan, and to other scholars. It resulted after his workshop in a, um, a, a trio of plays called Trios for Train, um, because that was a, a, they, they were holding the workshop near a railway station. And one of the, the participants in uh, this workshop was Ronnie Govan, who was to become the main pioneer of formal Indian South African or South Asian South African theater. Uh, his short play, uh, Beyond Calvary, is widely regarded as the first formal um, theater production uh, from the South Asian community in South Africa. Uh, and it, was, it came out of this workshop. So it was then Ronnie who, who went on quite a significant spree of writing um, from the late 60s until the mid 80s. And then of course he continued in the 90s, but it was in that period of prolific writing that he wrote many of his best known plays. Um, these include, of course, um, The Lani's Pleasure, which was the longest running play in South Africa's history, um, At the Edge and 1949, as well as Swamp. There were several others, but those are his ones that are most acclaimed. Um, and Ronnie trained a number of younger playwrights, including Kessie Govan, um, and so clearly was seen as the founder or the pioneer of South African Indian, or Indian South African theater. I use the term Indian South African because um, I believe that South African is a noun and Indian is uh, um, the adjective rather than some people who say South African Indian and do it the other way around. Uh, because as I have said earlier, identity wise, we see ourselves first and foremost as South African being of Indian origin. So just, just wanted to explain that. Um, basically, uh, uh, Ronnie was followed by Kesi Govender and Kribben Pillay. Uh, Kesi uh, founded the Stables Theatre in Durban, which became an iconic theatre that had a lot of work from both um, the, the South Asian and the African the Zulu communities in particular in Durban, and they, they did a lot of fusion work. Uh, Kribben Pillay was an academic at the then um, University of Durban West, what now known as the University of Puzzle in Natal, and some of his plays like Looking for Muruga are foundational. Uh, and then there were a number of playwrights that followed after, which I'll talk about now. But most of the plays in that initial period of the, the late 60s to the early 80s obviously took place in community halls because people of South Asian origin, like people um, of um, uh, African origin and of multiple heritage origin were banned from um, producing plays in mainstream theater. They couldn't hold their plays in any of our playhouses or even smaller theaters, which were controlled by the apartheid government or if they were privately owned, they had to follow the rules of apartheid, which did not allow black and white people to perform together on a stage um, or a screen. Um, and so the community halls became the avenue for presentation of theater. They weren't always obviously offering the best technical facilities, but there was a tremendous vibe in the 70s and 80s in particular with huge attendances at these community halls, whether they were in the so-called Indian townships or African townships or colored townships. Um, a lot of people attended. Sometimes there would be people from uh, African or Zulu backgrounds coming to the Indian townships to see plays and vice versa. But the they didn't have quite the technical support or the budgets to be able to do theater in any form of spectacle. It was minimalist theater and it formed a tradition of minimalist theater, it was very effective. Um, in the later 80s, uh, uh, even though apartheid still existed, uh, more public spaces opened up, more mainstream theaters began admitting uh, South Asian and Black African theater. And then there was a lot more, a lot broader exposure. I find it interesting that at the time of Ronnie's rise to prominence, it also mirrored the rise, of course, to what the man who's considered um, arguably to be our greatest ever playwright, Athol Fuga. Um, and he's a tremendous voice who wrote against apartheid in, in a number of plays and also wrote about uh, uh, poor white communities, which wasn't being tackled as well. Um, he's produced many world-class plays. Uh, he received more international attention, mainly because he's white. He's a great playwright, so I'm not in any way undermining him. I think he's our greatest player, one of the greatest ever. But he would have got more attention because he was white, even though he was very much from the left wing and against the apartheid government. He also suffered because of apartheid. He couldn't use black actors in some of the theaters because he wouldn't be allowed to use black actors in lead roles. 
Um, but he got more attention early on. He didn't have to perform in community halls as much as Ronnie did. And of course, some from the Black African tradition like Gibson Kinter. Gibson Kinter was another great community artist from the uh, um, Black African community who was very much like Ronnie Govender. He played in community halls. He played to the people from those community halls whose stories he was telling, which nobody else was telling. So uh, there is that parallel history, uh, um, but it also was very much divided because apartheid divided. And so Indian people had to perform mainly in their halls and black people in their halls and multiple heritage or colored people in their halls and white people could have the mainstream. Um, even though some of them like Akko Fugard wrote against apartheid, they still had more mainstream attention. Um, Kesi Govender and, and Kribben Pillay were next to follow, as I mentioned, along with Mutal Naidu. Mutal Naidu is female, uh, for those of you who might not know the name, um, and one of the few female playwrights from the South Asian community in those early days. She was very much a satirist and um, incurred the wrath of the apartheid government on numerous occasions. Uh, Kesi Govender's uh, uh, definitive work is Working Class Hero, which reflected bravely at the time on um, South Asian or Indian racism against Black African people. Uh, it's one of the most highly regarded plays in South Africa's history. And at the time, as I said, was seen as very courageous because he exposed this truth that there was a lot of racism within the South Asian community against Black African people. And a lot of that was part of the class struggle as well. Um, with middle class Indians discriminating against working class Black African. Um, we then had Kribin Pele, whose best known work is Looking for Muruga which is about identity. And in fact, uh, Ronnie's definitive works, The Lani's Pleasure at the Edge, 1949, along with Looking for Muruga and um, a Working Class Hero, um, are definitely plays about identity politics, race and class conflict, which became the main theme in uh, South Asian um, theater at that time, and probably still is the main theme to this day. Um, we then had other playwrights who, who uh, operated more in the 1990s and then the new millennium. Uh, and I think the more the, the four most significant there uh, would be, well, I mentioned Muthal Naidu, she, she was very little in the 90s, mainly in the 80s. But the other ones are Ismail Muhammad, who went on to become the director of the National Arts Festival and the um, CEO of the famous Market Theater. Um, and then also Rajesh Gopi um, and uh, Krije Govinder. It's another female playwright. Now, um, uh, in the 90s, the, the spaces of the playhouses and some of the private theaters opened um, completely to South Asian um, playwrights as well. And so um, uh, the play Cheaper Than Roses by Ismail Muhammad uh, was staged in Cape Town. Um, it's about identity politics, about a colored woman who uh, passes up off, off as white so that she can get some of the privileges during apartheid South Africa. But then as soon as she does this, apartheid falls, Nelson Mandela is released and we're working towards a new dispensation. So she loses those privileges and now has to work her way back to being colored because it might benefit her, but it actually doesn't because she's still leaving. So a nicely layered play there about our, our complexities and hypocrisies um, and contradictions. Um, Rajesh Gopi's two best known plays are Out of Bounds and The Cooley Odyssey. The Cooley Odyssey is about the journey of indenture. Um, it focuses on the, the, the um, arrival of the first indentures to South Africa, their perilous journey on the ship, and then how they fought to become recognized on the plantations in some way, fought for their rights, fought for uh, uh, um, and some degree of uh, respect and dignity, and then, of course, ends off with them forging a better life for themselves here, despite the horrible conditions. Um, Out of Bounds is one of the definitive works on the Indian contribution to the fight against apartheid, and then their um, attempts to find meaning and uh, substance in contemporary South Africa. Uh, it's a one-person play that's been performed um, on three continents. Uh, Krije Govinder's best known work is Woman in Brown, which examines the identity of um, Indian women uh, and the complexities and contradictions of this particular uh, identity politics paradigm. Um, Krije is better known as a stand-up comedian and a television producer. She hasn't written a lot of plays, but, but, but um, that play, Woman in Brown, is one of the best works we've had from the South Asian community. And her other work, uh, Buckle, which is about um, South Asian marriage, is one of the funniest works we've read from us, but not, not, not a play um, that could be studied perhaps academically. Um, so 
in contemporary South Africa now, we find, I believe, that there are many opportunities for South Asians to present stories about their community, but also, of course, to work in collaboration with other uh, artists from other communities, Black, African, white, uh, multiple heritage. And that has happened to some extent. But um, I also believe that the two dominant uh, paradigms occurring now, I should openly and honestly expose. My first point is that I, I believe that the Indian voice is diminishing um, rather than becoming more significant. Uh, there's still the stereotype of um, uh, um, Indian or South Asian people in South Africa that exists amongst other communities. Um, we're very often seen as um, being um, uh, um, 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 rich businessmen or academics or professionals. And this is simply not a fact because it has been proven through studies that more than half of the South Asian community in South Africa either lives in abject poverty or relative deprivation. Uh, there are many, many poor um, um, Indian South Africans. Uh, and this is not particularly well known, partly because some of the behavior of the richer Indian uh, 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 people in South Africa is quite garish. Uh, and they, they expose their wares in, 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 a, uh, in, in quite a, 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 a lavish fashion. Uh, but also it's because of the continued stereotyping that exists. And there's so little still known about the complexity of the community. I'm not entirely convinced that a lot of people understand the difference between religions of Hinduism and Islam. Um, I don't know if they understand the different, uh, different linguistic groups, the different rituals that play out. Uh, um, I, I, I'm, I've seen and heard many times uh, uh, this ignorance displayed. And I think that partly then puts us in a particular category. And it's an incomplete category as all stereotypes are. And in that sense, the voice is not seen as significant. Um, the black white binary is what really matters. So we still want to hear from white people and their stories because um, there's 5 million of them as opposed to one and a half million of us. And also because um, they want to rule this nation. And of course they're from the continent of Europe for many of them, um, they have their, their ancestry there and therefore their voice should be seen as significant. And then obviously black African community being making the majority of, of, uh, of our people uh, will have to have a significant voice as well. They've been subjugated during apartheid and, and obviously suffered terrible atrocities. So their voice should be hugely significant and it's becoming more significant, more so in the English language though. I believe there should be more works in their vernacular. But the Indian voice is at the moment, if not quite suppressed, certainly diminished. And particularly over the last decade when it's become uh, less significant. Um, and, and then, um, so basically, I think uh, I, I'm also seeing the time is going. So let me also gen, just uh, say the other aspect that I want to mention is that there has been a move in the last 20 years or so, particularly in the last 15, towards a lot more light entertainment from the South Asian community, uh, focused more on stand up comedy and film. There's nothing wrong with stand up comedy or film. I'm involved in both. Well, I was involved in stand up, I'm involved in film, but there isn't the, the, the sort of uh, um, um, probing work that we used to receive in both literary fiction and theater in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Um, choices made partly because of, of, of economic reality. Not a lot of people are going to see this theater these days or reading literary fiction. But also, I think that a new, some new artists have emerged who believe that they need to speak to the wider community in a lighter fashion mainly through comedy. And they continue to perpetuate stereotypes about the South Asian community. And I think that's doing a disservice to the community and not honoring our stories and our legacy. So um, I'm sure there'll be more questions about that. So I'll move on then now to uh, um, the second part of the talk, which is about uh, my particular journey. And I believe that um, this journey began um, uh, in 2001 and is on to, uh, uh, to 2022 now, so it's 21 years. Uh, but it really began in 2003 with my first play to house. 2001 was my first satire, The Rainbow Indignation, which was very popular, but it was not a very serious work. To house is my first play that I wrote in 2003. And I think the journey of To House mirrors the first decade of my experience as a playwright and actor and director in South Africa. Um, because to house was at first um, 
um, immediately chosen as part of the Panzer Play Reading Festival, which at that time was the most significant playwriting contest in South Africa. That was in 2003. It was written and a month later it made the final. And it went to Cape Town, which for me is still the bastion of racial discrimination in South Africa with respect to the very beautiful city. Um, it is where I believe you still find um, much of the old South Africa still in existence. And I encountered that uh, with House in 2003 in Cape Town because it was very much uh, an, an insider Cape Town um, um, audience, uh, uh, audience of artists, and they found the play a little strange, a little weird, a little too Durban-like, not quite representing what they thought South Africa was. And um, I, I found that interesting and also uh, bewildering because it was written not just about Durban but of all South Africa. Um, it then was picked up by the Playhouse and they bought the rights to it for a year. Uh, and they fell all over it. So Durban was very interested in Mr. Uh, so you had a, a little bit of alienation from Cape Town, but a lot of interest in Durban. Um, and the Playhouse, though, we found very interesting, my sister and I was part, of course, of the, the other half of the Sing siblings. We found that um, the Playhouse initially, some of the, the, the key management team wanted to put in some of their friends in it and thought, well, I mean, you know, we're giving an opportunity to a South Asian to put on a work here. We're buying the rights to it in one of the major theaters in South Africa. He won't mind if we just handle his, his uh, our way. And we were upset about it. We wanted it to be an open audition. We felt that this nepotism and cronyism should not be tolerated. So we took on the Playhouse and Linda Bocassini, the CEO, was quite happy that we did so. And she didn't want this to happen. So we forged a very good relationship with her and with her, her artistic team early on. And, um, and my politics then soon seemed to suit that institution because we wanted very much to have a non-racial society and one which was not favoring any particular group. So to house took off then, and then of course it got published. And I found that very interesting as well because it's published in New South African plays by, um, uh, uh, Aurora Metro Books in London. And when that happened, a lot of the people from Cape Town, as well as some from Durban, who didn't think the play was quite as significant a work or as good a work as it as they came to say thereafter, and they changed their minds uh, because now published, and because Playhouse bought the rights, they thought it must be a good play. So I find this quite amusing in some ways because it just suggests the ignorance that exists or that existed at that time. And there were a lot of old farts, I say this with respect. Um, who were in charge of theatre at that time, that has changed now. And they were ignorant, they were arrogant, they didn't quite understand um, the new wave of theatre that was going to happen in the next few years. years. And also, they had formal structures that were very rigid to house, as Dr. Rose, I'm sure, would uh, tell his students, is not structured in the conventional way that some plays are, um, the piece that is the two or three hander in a room uh, focused on the interpersonal conflict between these three characters or three characters. Uh, this is a multiple protagonist um, and it is, it's been mirrored in style and form now by many other works since then. But at that time, it caused a bit of consternation. And so in that regard, with regard to both its content and its structure, I think it mirrored the first decade of my experience in theatre in South Africa, where I was challenged for being unconventional at times, but also celebrated for being that at a local level, less so nationally, certainly in Durban and my province of KwaZulu-Natal, to some extent in Johannesburg in the province of Gauteng, but not in the broader South African landscape and not known yet internationally. The other play that was dominant at that time that I produced was Spice and Stuff, which had a much bigger, uh, a, a much more positive initial response. And again, that was partly, I believe, because I was writing about the South Asian community and I was writing about it in a way that I probably understood because it was from the South Asian community. So the wider world thought, okay, now he's writing about his people and about their story. So we appreciate that. Whereas opposed to Taos, I was writing about other communities as well. And this has been a running debate. And uh, Dr. Felicity Han, the editor of uh, the book, The Durban Dows, the section about my plays, has written about that also. And so has Dr. Rose. Um, so the second half was characterized by a huge uh, significant stride both nationally and internationally. This is when I came to be recognized both academically and in cultural practice with trips overseas to, to India and to London to put on plays, Rioka Light to House, um, uh, sorry, Rioka Light and Marital Blitz. Uh, and of course, um, being studied at a variety of universities in South Africa, India, Mauritius, Canada, and um, um, Europe, particularly Spain and the UK. 
Um, you know, there, there are a number of scholars who've contributed to this, Dr. Rose being one of them, Dr. Felicity Hand, um, um, as well as uh, Dr. Betty Govindan. Um, we have Prof. Uh, uh, Joshipura, I've mentioned, uh, Jerosha Mudli, Prof. Priya Naras Mulu, um, uh, Prof. Debbie Lukti, many of them contributed to the book of articles on my plays. Some of them have presented at conferences around the world and seminars, and of course, some of them have written articles about my work. I'm very grateful to them because they've taken this work to the wider world. It is really difficult, despite opportunities that I've had, to tour theatre beyond South Africa, even in South Africa. Um, there's poor funding from government. Um, I, in particular, would find it difficult to receive funding because there's racism in funding as well. Uh, people of the South Asian community are not receiving much funding. I've hardly ever applied for funding, I must be honest and say that, but I haven't actually received any when I have applied, uh, applied as well. And so it is mainly my own resources in combination with the Playhouse Company, who's been very supportive, and the Catalina Theatre Company, which no longer exists, but used to support my work as well, that I was able to get into other parts of South Africa, including the National Arts Festival. But to take it overseas is extremely expensive. Certainly, I received assistance from, in, from both India and the UK, but not to pay for airfares, um, and not to pay for accommodation. So those things make it extremely expensive. And one can only take smaller works like Ryoka Light or Swing or Shooting, works that are one or two handers, because it's impossible to take an ensemble. It, it's just far too expensive. Of course, there's now talk of putting on my work um, um, in those countries by production companies there. There's, at the moment, we're working on putting on to house in the Catalan language in Spain and putting on Rioja Light in the Gujarati language in uh, um, uh, India uh, because it's been translated into those languages and published in those countries. So um, I think that the opportunity from the academics and cultural practitioners who've talked about my work, written about my work, invited me to speak, has really opened wonderful doors for me. And these people are not just substantial academics, but really good human beings as well. And so I become friends with many of them. And I am deeply grateful for the way they've exposed my work and I admire what they've written about it, what they've said about it. Um, and they've taught me through the process as well. I, I want to, uh, largely because of time constraints now, uh, uh, just move to um, um, a little bit examining the themes in my work and then the kind of characters I explore um, and before I just do a couple more readings. The main themes in my oeuvre are identity politics, race and class conflict in post-apartheid South Africa, the impact of violent crime on both working class and middle class communities, patriarchy and gender-based discrimination, post-traumatic stress disorder and the underappreciation of its impact in contemporary South Africa, and endemic corruption and its erosion of the initial gains in our constitutional democracy. And I think um, in many ways, these are the main themes of South African theater across the board right now. Although we've moved to being a lot more commercial and also there's much less theater now because of the pandemic as well as diminishing audiences. So we move more towards film now. And the fact is that those who are putting on theater, the Star Wars in particular, like Mike Van Kran and Lara Foote and um, uh, um, uh, Aubrey Sakabi, uh, Paul Krutboom, these people are putting on works that are dealing with these things. Um, they still explore the social political landscape of South Africa, and often they challenge government as well. So we're still brave, but there's far fewer works like that happening mainly because of the lack of resources, but also because of diminishing audiences. People are cocooning more so than ever because of the pandemic's impact. And so they watch Netflix rather than go to the theater. My latest play, Free Fall, which is about exactly the political landscape in South Africa right now, and state capture, um, drew reasonable audiences, but had to have a very short run of no more than three nights because we couldn't sustain a longer run given the current circumstances. And again, the number of cases we're still having in South Africa were uh, COVID positive. So yes, we filled up every night there, but it was only a 50% capacity that could be allowed. And while the response was good, I was wondering, could I sustain this over three to four weeks? I'm not sure I can. I think we've lost our audience and we'll continue to do so uh, because of the pandemic's impact, because of the diminishing interest in theater, people are not choosing to go to theater on Friday and Saturday night. They'll go to concerts, they'll go to stand-up comedy, they'll watch television and the internet, but not go to theater, which is very sad. Uh, and I'm happy to explore that in questions. Um, it, most of my works are, are uh, character-based dramas and dramedies. There are no heroes and villains, flawed people with quirks, inconsistencies and contradictions. 
and my plays feature academics, professionals, entrepreneurs, artisans, teachers, sportspersons, hawkers, policemen, politicians, housewives, and house husbands. Some of the plays have been predominantly about the South Asian community because I had to depict our history. Somebody has to tell our story. And there are many doing that in fiction and non-fiction, not so much in drama. But um, uh, the, 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 the fact is that uh, uh, I don't only write about the South Asian community. I've also written about other communities, and Dr. Rose has spoken about that. And most of my plays have a diversity of characters, especially Zulu and multiple heritage characters. Um, I mentioned earlier about the diminishing impact of the in Indian voice or the South Asian voice because of, because of political factors, but also because of the choice of many South Asian artists to move into light entertainment, uh, whether it be theater or film or comedy. Um, there is a genuine move over the last 15 years or so not to take risks, not to present works about our social political landscape, not to deal with three dimensional characters, but to present essentially stereotypes to continue the story of these stereotypes in the South Asian community, which I find disappointing and frustrating. I'm going to, to, to I've got 40 minutes done now, I believe. So I'm going to come to an end talking about my diversification and then finally quickly on COVID. Um, I have decided partly for the reasons I've already given, but partly because of the reasons I'm going to give you now, to diversify further. Yes, I've written a novel, but that was very much a natural process. It was always going to happen. I always wanted to write a novel, and it's one of my plays that I've turned into a novel anyway, shooting. So that's not surprising. I don't really think that's diversification. I'm talking about film. So I'm moving from what is essentially a theater practitioner with a variation in film to now a filmmaker with a variation in theater. And it's not defeatist. I love theater, it's my first love, but I have always loved film as well. And it is time now for me to take the film journey. I have stories that I want to tell and some I've written scripts already of that need to be told through film. I'm also very much interested in documentary feature film, the documentary short film. And that obviously is something I'm gonna pursue quite rigorously in the years to come. Um, so theater you know, can handle those aspects as well, but obviously there's a whole range of things you can do on film. But fiction film also interests me, um, but also limited series. I've got a, I'm gonna do a, hopefully soon a limited series on Ryoka Light. And I've just made a sketch comedy show called Popcom, which is a satirical take on life in Durban. So film for me is a passion, but I also need a new audience because we're just simply not reaching enough people in South Africa through theater. And it may be likely when I tour India with, with Rio Kalite in the next couple of years that I reach more people there than I would in South Africa because of our diminishing audience. So one does need a new audience as well, but it's mainly I, I'm moving more into film because of great passion for film and wanting to experiment in this medium. But it's also a bit of a lament on the diminishing audiences in theater, and the fact that we're not telling enough probing stories about our contemporary reality in that medium. Finally, to, to end with COVID, um, it's been, for me, still a very positive two years when I was able to launch a couple of books, launch a film, launch a theater production, um, and stay in touch with my writing and produce some new works. But it has been an absolutely devastating impact on our artists in respect to COVID-19 here in South Africa, as it has been around the world. But particularly here, because we have a corrupt government um, whose agencies stole so much money that was meant for artists. And this has been exposed in the um, South African media and, I, and I hopefully I, I believe in the world media as well. We're still recovering those monies. It is part of the state uh, capture um, apparatus. And it is really, really sad that it has happened because so many artists went completely out of business and have had to take other jobs or are unemployed because that relief fund from the president's office never reached. Some are starving because of this. And obviously, like other artists around the world, we couldn't go on live for the two years. And theater and dance is live art. It can't be just gravitate onto screen like music has been able to do, or even stand-up comedy. We need the communal experience of an audience. And therefore we couldn't do much. Um, um, and there, there wasn't much funds you could raise even going onto the screen. So in that time, it's been a, a terrible experience for our artists. I'm not entirely sure that the industry will fully recover, but I'm very happy to say that there has been a fight back from artists, both the stand organization and the theater and dance alliance known as Tata. Uh, they have been formed 
to build the industry again, to rebuild it, and to support artists and to access funds both from here and overseas and to provide advocacy for artists' rights. They've, they've come up for the first time in our history with a charter of rights for artists. I'm a patron of the STAND organization, but I'm delighted to say there are a number of younger artists than me who are leading the Theatre and Dance Alliance and the STAND Foundation. And this is a genuine attempt to keep theatre and dance alive and to hold the government to account, which we have to do. And they have been quite successful thus far, but it's going to be a long, hard battle and one that I hope we win. And we do need the wider community to support us. They need to come back to theater. They need to assist us with funding. Uh, they need to, to remember again that some of the greatest contributions to South Africa's history were made by artists, performing artists, in the fight against apartheid and in shaping our new landscape with these wonderful stories. So I'm going to stop there. and Thank you again for this opportunity. I'm delighted to take questions now. And if there's anything you feel I haven't, covered as well, please let me know. Thank you very much.